Early June, 1967. The six-day war in the Middle East between Israel, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria is underway. A spy ship, very lightly armed, but bristling with antennae, steams into the Mediterranean to eavesdrop on the conflict. It is patrolling in international waters off the Egyptian coast. At two in the afternoon, on June the 8th, with the war reaching its climax, Israeli jets and motor torpedo boats launch an unprovoked attack on the ship. They drop napalm and strafe its decks with rockets, cannon fire and armored piercing rounds before trying to sink it with torpedoes. We had no way to defend ourselves and it was just, we we're just slaughtered. And they shot up the life rafts uh, that were put into the water and they shot the ones that were still on board the ship. Bullet holes, shell holes everywhere, blood. The forecastle, the front part of the ship, was just red with blood. Throughout the attack, the ship flies the Stars and Stripes, the flag of Israel's closest ally, the United States of America. Its name, the USS Liberty, is freshly painted on its stern, and the bow carries the distinctive numbers of an American naval vessel. Out of a crew of just under 300, there were 34 killed and 172 injured in varying degrees to uh, life-threatening, life-debilitating injuries. So that was more than two-thirds of the crew. This audio tape, which has never been broadcast before, was recorded in real time by the Israeli military during the assault. The woman's voice in the background is counting down the seconds. It proves that Israeli commanders knew all along that they were attacking an American ship. For the first time, this and other evidence allows us to reveal the true story of what happened that day and what came after. When a deadly assault by one ally on another was covered up and an American president was manipulated by the secret agents of a foreign power, events that have shaped U.S.-Israeli relations ever since. The United States Navy Memorial in Washington, D.C., June the 8th, 2014. Every year, on the anniversary of the attack on the USS Liberty, survivors, relatives, and supporters gather together. It's a remembrance of those who, who were killed that day, the 34. I'm Dave Lucas. I was in charge of the deck force. I was 25. My first child was born when I was one day out on that cruise. So as long as they're survivors and, and maybe children of survivors, I think this will probably be an annual event. And salute. The names of the 34 killed are read out. Oh. Jack Raper. Punctuated by the tolling of a Navy bell. David Marlborough. And the playing of taps, the traditional military funeral lament. It's important to not forget what happened and to continue to try to find out why it happened and, and who made it happen. In the summer of 1967, America was in turmoil. An incendiary mixture of racial discrimination and extreme poverty exploded into a summer of rioting in cities across the country. But one issue dominated.
the Vietnam War. In all, 10,000 troops would die that year. The Americans were trapped. They couldn't leave, and they couldn't win. In the Middle East, too, war looked inevitable. There was growing tension between Israel and its Arab neighbors. Armies were mobilizing. Israel promised the White House they would not attack first. But on the 5th of June, they jammed radar sets at the US Embassy in Tel Aviv, so the Americans couldn't detect their jets taking off to launch a surprise assault on Egypt. Meanwhile, the USS Liberty was sailing across the Mediterranean into the war zone. Liberty was a state-of-the-art intelligence-gathering vessel of the time, and what we did is we listened. We were a listening ship. My name is Lloyd Painter. I was a research officer. We could, send, we could receive any signal that was out there, low band, high band, anything, intercepting it, recording it. And we did have on board some translators who could have an immediate translation of what was going on. We would actually bounce signals off the moon back to NSA. We were, we're spies. I'm Jim Cavanaugh. I was a communication technician aboard the USS Liberty, and I intercepted Morse code. We're spies. I mean, we're intercepting messages from embassies, uh, military bases, police, anything and everything that we could get to ensure that the United States was comfortable with what was going on in the world and no one's conspiring against us. And basically, it was to protect our interests. This was the Cold War. American President Lyndon Johnson knew that the Russians already had substantial military influence in Egypt. He needed to find out what they were going to do next to make sure that a local conflict did not become a world war, with the USA backing Israel and Russia siding with the Arab cause. I was assigned as a Russian linguist aboard the ship. I'm Bryce Lockwood. United States Marine Corps retired to Israelis. Our primary purpose was to intercept communications of the Russian spy aircraft as it were at Alexandria, Egypt. And that was our job was to find them. We were not targeted against the Israelis. Life was very relaxing. One of the nice things about the Liberty is we had air conditioning because we had communications equipment. So we were cool in the hot days. It was a very laid back, very clean ship. It was, it was spotless. The morale was pretty high, I mean, very high. By the time the Liberty arrived off the coast of Egypt on the 8th of June, the war had just two days left to run. Israel had seized the old city of Jerusalem, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip. Jordanian forces were beaten, and Egypt was conceding defeat. Only Syria held out. Uh, the airwaves were dead. Uh, the only voices we did get were those of Israeli or Hebrew was what we were hearing. My name is uh, Bob Wilson. Um, I worked for uh, NSA on June the 8th, 1967, when the, when, uh, what we were trying to monitor, find something coming from the direction of, of Egypt. There just was nothing. They owned the skies and the ground and everything. They, they, I don't think there was anything moving at that time that they didn't know about. I was listening to the chatter the night before. They, they knew it was an American ship that came into the area. They knew who we were. 5.15 a.m., first light. The ship's log recorded an Israeli photo reconnaissance plane flying over the Liberty. It was easily identifiable as a Noratlas aircraft, and those are photo reconnaissance aircraft. Israeli records obtained by Al Jazeera show that their reconnaissance plane reported the Liberty as an American spy ship, hull number GTR-5. Well, I was on the bridge. I'm John Scott. I was the damage control officer. And it circled the ship kind of in a broad circle and headed back towards Israel. Israeli planes then continued to fly over the Liberty all morning. And they would do half moon passes over us, and we saw that they were Israeli. They were slowly lumbering over our ship, and we were waving at them, they were waving at us. They were sophisticated, almost as sophisticated as we were as far as surveillance and, and, and technology. They had everything. We supplied them with all the technology to this day. And I felt that we were, in, we were in great shape because they knew who we were. They're our friends. We felt safe. Actually, it was a secure feeling to see them. There was one other thing which made the crew feel safe. 
we had an American flag flying the standard. And then we put up the holiday colors, which is a huge American flag. And it was a bright sunny day with the wind blowing, I don't know, five or 10 knots, the flag was unfurled. You could see it for miles. Meanwhile, Israeli military jets were on their way. On the real-time audio tape obtained by Al Jazeera, at 1.53 p.m., the pilots asked their base control about the ship. The USS Liberty was the only ship of any size in the area. The American 6th Fleet, including two aircraft carriers, was 500 miles away. Oh, it, it was a great day. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Jim Smith. I was a damage controlman in engineering. I mean, I'm 20 years old at the time. I come from a small town, I used to throw hay bales in, uh, in the summertime for a buck an hour. Sun was shining, blue sky, clouds, nice. People sunbathing on the deck. We had lunch, and five minutes later, maybe, here came the jets, and we, nobody really knew what was happening until they started firing. The captain said to me, alert the forward gun mounts, we're under attack. And I tried to raise the, uh, the two sailors in the forward gun mounts. I looked out, and they were, they were blown to pieces by the rocket. When the attack started, and we realized that we needed help, we tried to communicate with the Sixth Fleet. They were jamming both our distress frequencies and our tactical frequencies. The tactical frequencies is all right, but the international distress frequencies is a violation of international law to jam them, and the Israelis were jamming them. And we could not get a signal across. Here's the question I have to ask. Who would know the frequencies other than an ally? And who was the ally in the war? It wasn't Egypt. It was Israel. They would know, and only they would know in this conflict, what our frequencies would be. Now cut off from the outside world, the crew on the Liberty was defenseless. We had 450 caliber machine guns on board that were basically there to repel any borders that might come by, you know, a pirate situation. Certainly weren't designed to bring down uh, jet aircraft that were hammering at us. But you can't shoot a jet going 600 miles an hour with a 50 caliber machine gun. It doesn't work. It was just a surreal scene. People who had been standing there earlier joking and laughing were now dead, dying, and with the walking dead and wounded. It was just unreal. Gasoline barrels stored on the deck of the ship burst into flames. The crew rushed to try to put out the fires. I was watching the aircraft as they circled around, and when they got to coming back towards the ship, I'd just holler at him, down. They'd fire, and circle back around, we'd jump back up and keep fighting the fire. The rocket noise is horrendous when a rocket explodes. You can't escape a rocket. I don't care where you go. What the crew didn't know was that at three minutes past two, the Israeli pilots were ordered to use a new, much deadlier weapon. The biggest problem, I guess, from, from that was the napalm, which they dropped from the airplane. The napalm had burned, scorched almost the entire front part of the ship, the bridge area. The whole top side of the ship had been set on fire and it was all charred. It was no longer navy gray. You have to stop the fires to stop the flooding to keep that ship afloat. That's your home. You got nowhere else to go. You can't pack up and go down the road because there is no down the road. Up above, the Israeli military argued about what should happen next and who should sink the liberty. I remember thinking, I was in pretty good shape then. I, th I said, I think I can swim it to the shore. And then I thought sharks. And I thought a lot of things, all, all quickly, you know. <laughs> At 11 minutes past two, with the Israeli jets running out of ammunition, the pilots were instructed to fly down and confirm the identity of the ship. 
It was now 12 minutes past two, and the Israeli control tower knew for certain this was an American ship, the same one its forces had first identified at 5.15 a.m. that morning, and then buzzed again during seven additional reconnaissance flights throughout the day. The jets then pulled out, but three Israeli Navy motor torpedo boats were already on their way. The USS Liberty was a spy ship. In the event of an attack, it was standard procedure for the spies on board to destroy everything, just in case it fell into enemy hands. Everyone was destroying material. Every, everyone was uh, stripping information off of computers, ripping computers open, pulling information out. That's something you just don't want to hear aboard ship. You've done all this work, collected this intelligence and processed it, and now you have to destroy it. You just didn't want the enemy to get a hold of anything classified. At 2.35, the Israeli motorboats fired five torpedoes. Four missed, but one hit. It had been over nine hours since the Israeli military first identified the Liberty. Israeli planes had flown over it repeatedly, and 20 minutes earlier, their control tower had confirmed it yet again as an American ship. 25 Americans were about to die in a single moment. This is what it looks like when a torpedo hits a ship the size of the Liberty. The torpedo threw us up in the air like a roller coaster, it felt like one coming down. Dead silence, lights all off, smoke and haze everywhere. I went back to the drinking fountain and uh, filled it with blood, reached down to get a drink and a black man stared back at me. And when it fell back to get right, it just kept getting wrong. Kept sinking and sinking and sinking. We just waited, all of us waited, thinking that this was it. We're going down. And uh, I figured that was the end of life for me. The torpedo had blown a huge hole in the hull, 39 feet by 24, killing 25 Americans in a single hit. The torpedo hit the room that I was in, and it was just luck. This guy died, this one lived, that guy died. It was how much shrapnel was coming in your direction. You know, the old-fashioned typewriters? I had the letter H sticking out of my left foot. I had, I don't know, 80 pieces of shrapnel in my lower extremities, and the place filled up with water that fast. Totally black, totally filled with powder and oil. It was like you were gagging, and you only had about eight or 10 inches of space where you could catch a breath. Only way I could go in that direction was to drop down and swim underwater four or five strokes, come back up, and then frantically catch a breath and try to find something else to hold on to. I got pulled through the hatch and onto the deck. Others were not so lucky. My friend Ronnie Campbell had a desk right there. And I remember Ronnie saying, you fellas can do what you want to, so I'm going to write a letter home. And he stuck a piece of paper in his mill, his typewriter, and began typing, Dear Eileen, you won't believe what's happening to us. And just seconds after that, the torpedo struck and killed both the two Marines, killed uh, my friend Ronnie Campbell. And my job was to try to get probably 20 or 30 wounded sailors out to the main deck and to the life rafts. So I went up and looked out myself before I tried to get anyone up. And that's when I observed a motor torpedo boat, Israeli, plainly marked with the Star of David, uh, machine gunning our life rafts. 
The crew of the Liberty were now trapped on board their own ship with nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. The torpedo uh, boats came in closer and began to machine gun the uh, ship using armor-piercing projectiles. The armor-piercing, the shells that they were using were leaving holes about that big around in the, the metal plating. Just peeled it out like it was orange peel. At close range, the armor-piercing rounds ripped through the steel hull of the ship. Nowhere was safe. This bullet was retrieved from one of the navigational books at the rear portion of the bridge. It had penetrated the skin of the ship, gone through at least one other book, and then stopped in, in the second book. This is part of an armor-piercing shell. The outer portion or jacket makes the hole that this then goes through. And a bullet like this that hit uh, Seaman Francis Brown and, and killed him. He died right on the spot, just fell to the floor dead. He was just barely 18. There weren't enough helmets to go around for everyone. It was like sitting in a cardboard box and having somebody shoot through it. The, the bullets were just coming everywhere. Throughout the attack, the Liberty had been silent to the outside world. All its aerials were either smashed or jammed. We had one whip antenna which hadn't worked the entire cruise and it had a bullet hole in it. One of the radio men had taken a reel of coax cable and ran it from one of the transmitters back there to that whip antenna and took some shrapnel in the process. He got out and made a Firefox, Firefox, this is Rock Star, Rock Star. Under attack by unidentified surface and naval air units require immediate assistance. The American Sixth Fleet was 500 miles away and picked up the signal. So did the Israeli armed forces. The attack stopped shortly afterwards. The American aircraft carriers were in the middle of a nuclear weapons drill and had to rearm with conventional bombs before they could take off. Once the Israelis knew the US jets were in the air, they summoned the American naval attaché and told him there had been a terrible mistake. The American planes were recalled. As they returned, Israeli helicopters flew out to the Liberty. This one had some personnel from the uh, Israeli government and the U.S. Naval Attaché dropped a uh, brown paper sack on the deck in the forepart of the ship, weighted down with an orange, had a business card in it. It landed right next to the severed leg of one of the deck personnel. And the note said, do you have casualties? Pretty obvious that there were casualties. I mean, there's still body parts and blood streaming down the bulkheads. So his message, do you have casualties, was kind of out of place. One of the sailors carried that sack back to the captain. And the captain took out the note and read it, looked up at the helicopter and popped the social finger at him. June the 8th, 1967, the height of the Six Day War. The USS Liberty, an American spy ship, had just been attacked by Israeli jets and torpedo boats while in international waters off Egypt. Badly damaged, two-thirds of its crew were dead or wounded. As soon as the news reached Washington, the attack on the Liberty instantly triggered a domestic political crisis. According to documents released under the Freedom of Information Act, one solution suggested in American government circles was to sink the liberty so journalists could not photograph it and inflame public opinion against the Israelis. The NSA rejected this idea with an impolite comment. Handling the media became the top 
priority. I was taken to my home in White Oak, Maryland. My name is uh, Patricia Blue Rishakis, and my husband was killed on the Liberty. And by the time I got there, there were any number of people from the National Security Agency there. They were there to make sure that I didn't speak to anyone uh, from the press, and I didn't. They stayed night and day. Back in the Mediterranean, the Liberty was now listing at 10 degrees, a massive hole in the hull above and below the waterline. The planes that they said they were sending to us never arrived. What I was afraid of, and I think most of us, was that we were going to sink. Well, the mess decks was, uh, was pretty much littered with the wounded. It looks like something out of a horror movie with people standing around or lying, wounded and dead and stunned, their heads missing, parts of their bodies. The Liberty had only one doctor on board with very limited medical resources. There was not a table that wasn't being used with a body on it or a wounded body on it. The doctor fixed compound fractures and treated bullet and shrapnel wounds while blood transfusions were given arm to arm. It was, um, it was real bad. And the doctor said to him, do you want me to operate? He says, you're probably gonna die if I do it and you'll certainly die if I don't. And, and he said, go ahead, doctor. And so when the doctor operated, uh, we held him as tight as we could. It was horrible pain, I'm sure, for him. And uh, all of a sudden, he went, he went limp and he died right there. I don't want to ever see anything like that again. Captain McGonagall received a pretty bad leg injury, lost a lot of blood. He was navigating by the stars. We had a, a little bit of power and tons of water in our belly, which meant the ship waved back and forth all night long. The next day, American ships arrived to take the injured and the dead off the Liberty. The American government now made sure that no journalists could get anywhere near the crew. When they took the severely wounded to various parts, they uh, actually posted guards on their room so that no one could be interviewed by the press. The total press blackout was in effect. Back in Washington, the government ensured there was little information for the press, while politics went on behind closed doors. I was told to go up urgently to the uh, seventh floor. Well, my name is Bill Woolley. I was in charge of the Arab Israel desk. Sit in because the Secretary uh, of State himself, Dean Rusk, had summoned uh, Ambassador Harmon of Israel to come in urgently. And uh, uh, so I sat through the meeting taking notes, and uh, in a loud voice, the secretary was, was really demanding some explanation for why and what had happened. The ambassador himself seemed to be ignorant of the incident. He immediately said, I can't believe what you're telling me. It's, it would be impossible. It would be unheard of. It was especially tough for Lyndon Johnson to date the most pro-Israeli American president in history. Johnson was uh, in a very tough mood. Uh, I'm Tom Hughes. I was director in the State Department, director of intelligence and research at the time of the um, Liberty incident in 67. Attack on the Liberty, Johnson himself briefed Newsweek magazine off the record that the Israelis had attacked, and the reason they'd attacked was that they thought this was an intelligence ship that was intercepting perhaps Israeli as well as Egyptian communications. But then everything changed. The fact that Johnson himself was the leaker uh, and briefer of Newsweek was soon leaked. And this alarmed, of course, the Israeli embassy and, and their, their leading friends in the Jewish organizations. The Israeli embassy uh, regarded this as a major problem uh, and that uh, what Johnson had told Newsweek uh, practically amounted to blood libel. Declassified Israeli documents show they were going to threaten President Johnson with blood libel, gross anti-Semitism, and that would end his political career. Blackmail. This is Admiral Bobby R. Inman. 
U.S. Navy retired. I'm a former director of the National Security Agency. But they know if he is thinking about running again, he's going to need money for his campaign. Uh, so uh, alleging that he's blood libeling is going to arouse the Jewish donors. The Israeli government hired teams of lawyers, some of whom were close friends of Lyndon Johnson, and began an all-out offensive. They lent on the media to kill critical stories and slanted others in favor of Israel. There was a, a campaign mounted to s see if what could be done about returning Johnson to his normal, uh, predictable pro-Israeli position. At the time, Johnson was still undecided as to whether to run for president the following year. Efforts were to be made to remind the president of the delicacy of his own position, that he personally uh, would, might lose support uh, for his run for re-election in 1968. Israeli tactics were clever. They identified Johnson's soft spot, the war in Vietnam, and gave him two extraordinary gifts, neither of which were made public at the time. The first was political. One of Johnson's complaints about Israel was that many of the Jewish organizations and the heads of uh, leaders in the Jewish community were opposing him on Vietnam. And they were suddenly becoming more silent on Vietnam as the liberty crisis uh, moved. So he also knew that there was a move back in his favor if he was moderate on Israel. There was a second gift, much more secret, but vital to the American president. The dreadful death toll in Vietnam was dominating the domestic news agenda. The North Vietnamese had Russian surface-to-air missiles, which were bringing down American aircraft on a daily basis. The American military attaché in Israel got a surprise visit from a senior Israeli intelligence officer. Took some helicopters and went across the North Red Sea to the surface-to-air missile sites and not only captures them, but took back everything. The launchers, the missiles, the, the manu maintenance manuals, the rest of it. And then he went to the U.S. Embassy, to the air attaché, and said, I think I have something you might be interested in. And, of course, those were the same missiles that our aircraft flying over North Vietnam were encountering day to day. And countermeasures was a huge issue. So grateful was the American government, they gave Israel two gifts in return. They resupplied them with the weapons they had just lost in the war, and the Liberty Inquiry, run by the Department of Defense, the DOD, was watered down. All that's influenced by what have we benefited from, from the captured SA-2 missile sites. Soon, uh, Johnson did respond and took a much more lenient line and wished that the whole incident could be put behind us as soon as possible. Johnson's softer approach to Israel was immediately reflected in the American Navy inquiry, which was now underway on board the Liberty. We began to realize that a cover-up was, was, was descending upon us. A lot of people that were in a key position to offer testimony were not given that opportunity. I testified to the machine gunning of life rafts to the captain's state of mind. And uh, it was that those two issues in particular were totally omitted. Lloyd Painter was not the only officer to have his testimony ignored. I saw what looked like unburned Vaseline. And I scraped a little bit of it off and put it in the jar and sealed the cap on. And I presented it to the court of inquiry. And that's the last I saw of that jar. There was no mention of napalm. And I'm sure that's what it was. They didn't want to hear any of that. I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know it until many months later that none of that had been recorded. Looking back on it, it was a total sham. The U.S. Court of Inquiry reported in just 20 days. It was a rush job, full of spelling mistakes, much key evidence ignored, no Israelis interviewed, and it exonerated them from blame. I read the Court of Inquiry and realized that my statements had been stricken from the record and never recorded. So I, I knew then for certain that the cover-up was, was massive. The Israelis then rushed out their own report, which concluded that the whole affair was a series of mistakes and that no one was to blame. The only dissenting voice was that of the Israeli ambassador in Washington. 
he sent a secret telegram back home arguing that Israel was clearly guilty. He cited the audio tape of the attack, the existence of which was known to top Israeli officials, and mentioned the crucial 20-minute gap that followed the Liberty's identification and the launch of the torpedoes against her. He said they should own up to what they had done and put the guilty on trial. His advice was ignored. The focus now was to repair the damage to American-Israeli relations. The Israelis have always been very skillful at uh, tracking what the U.S. government is doing, saying, thinking, and uh, effort to influence it. And they're by no means the only country that does it. Many do. They're just more effective at it than most. And the great advantage they have as compared to other countries uh, is their influence in the Congress. Around the time of the attack, the Washington Post had noted that the Jewish lobby could help determine the outcome of 169 of the 270 electoral votes needed to win the White House. The big emotive words about the attack disappeared from press releases at the Pentagon and a much more bland and neutral sounding uh, discourse uh, occurred. And this was true of the private uh, briefings that uh, official people in the Pentagon made about the incident. But whatever was said to journalists, every U.S. intelligence head believed the attack was intentional. One of them wrote, a nice whitewash for a group of ignorant, stupid, and inept XXX. The Jewish community has always been uh, more generous than many of their other counterparts in supporting financially uh, elections, political causes in the process. That does translate into influence. Many of Johnson's closest friends and advisors were pro-Israeli, and they reported back to Tel Aviv on his every move. The Israeli story constantly shifted to counter whatever new intelligence the White House received. So sensitive were these communications that the Israelis used code names to protect the identity of their White House agents. But for the first time, the members of the ring can be named. Hamlet was a million dollar fundraiser for the Democrats. When he rang, Johnson took his calls. He was Abe Feinberg. Menashe was Arthur Goldberg, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. Harare was David Ginsburg, a high-profile Washington lawyer who also represented the Israeli embassy. Ilan was Supreme Court Justice Abe Fortas. Lyndon Johnson had dinner with him on the eve of the Six-Day War. The strategy worked. The U.S.-Israeli relationship proved to be stronger than the killing and injuring of more than 200 Americans. The American-Israeli relationship was very much at stake, and it uh, was brought back from the precipice. The crucial intelligence came from the US ambassador to the United Nations, Arthur Goldberg. He warned Tel Aviv that the United States had the audio tape which revealed Israeli pilots knew it was an American ship before they attacked. The tape was quietly buried. I think a conscious decision was made to sweep it under the rug, to put it behind. My reading is that the U.S. government had made a decision to uh, accept the apology and reject the, you know, the rationale, but don't push it further. With the politics sorted, the only remaining issue was the fate of the USS Liberty badly damaged and now in Malta for extensive repairs. The torpedo hole was massive and was revealed to be much bigger once they got the ship into dry dock and drained it of water. The sealed compartment was a water-filled tomb, full of bodies, body parts, and top secret equipment. You could smell death and you could smell oil. That's what I remember. As soon as the air hit the bodies, they began to deteriorate rapidly. You do what you have to do. They were your shipmates, still are. The Navy was more concerned with equipment parts than they were body parts. But when I went down, I knew that you couldn't separate the two. We had to start shoveling up the, uh, the, the, the parts, 168 bags worth. Elsewhere, the makeup artists were getting to work. 
we were in the dry dock about six weeks. And 300 Maltese workers. They're working two shifts a day and I think seven days a week to try. They were cutting out the shell holes, welding plates over that, uh, and uh, fabricating metal to cover the torpedo hole. And then in one day, they painted the entire ship. We looked like nothing ever happened. We took it across the Atlantic. It was like being in a cemetery. But when we pulled into port, we looked good. This press and everything were there. And uh, we looked like basically nothing really happened. So it was great for the press to downplay what really happened to us. While the survivors met the widows and friends, the 168 bags of body parts and top secret equipment were quietly taken to an incinerator and burnt. A year later, and the Liberty Captain William McGonagall was given the Medal of Honor, America's highest award for gallantry. The tradition has always been that it is presented by the president in the White House. I look at these two gallant Marines and I see America. Captain McGonagall never heard words like these from his commander-in-chief. There was no television coverage for him as he received his medal in a quiet ceremony in the Navy Yard. President Johnson was just four miles away at the time. He stayed in the White House to hand out diplomas to school children. The reason was revealed in this internal memo, which advised President Johnson that due to the nature and sensitivity of these awards, they should be given by the Department of Defense, not by him. The advice was clear. No press release regarding them should be made. When I received my Purple Heart in a, in a secret ceremony in the captain's office, I was admonished, threat of court-martial, don't ever tell anyone where you got this. Don't ever tell anyone how you got this medal. The following year, American aid to Israel increased fourfold, and President Johnson agreed a treaty classified above top secret with Israel for the mutual exchange of intelligence, an arrangement which is still in place today, codenamed Stone Ruby. One of the things that bothers me is there wasn't a nice explanation of what went on. No one wants to talk about the why. The big secret the Israelis wanted to protect was their next move. They had told the Americans that this was to be a limited war and not a land grab. But on June 8, 1967, their forces were poised to attack and seize the Golan Heights and invade Syria, something they wished to keep from the White House until they'd done it. Successive American administrations, both Republican and Democrat, had refused to deal with the liberty. Even the issue of war crimes against unarmed Americans has never been addressed. There was a war crimes report filed by the Liberty Veterans Association to address the issues of such war crimes as firing on life rafts. That was never answered properly. I don't think it was answered, period. The people who were responsible for attacking the liberty, liberty were, you know, by and large, the military individuals in the war room. I don't know how many, four, eight, ten. Um, those are the people who came up with the plan. Those are the individuals who were responsible for the attack. The pilots, the motor torpedo boat personnel, they were ordered. You know, you don't follow orders, go to, go to jail. So they have to follow through. It wasn't the Israeli people who ordered that attack. It wasn't the average Jewish person who ordered that attack. We really need to exonerate the average Jewish person, Israeli, from this and go towards those individuals who are responsible for the attack. No one was really willing to take this on. Not the Star State Department, the White House, not the Congress. It's in everybody's best interest to just let this go. And that's exactly what they did. But by doing that, they left a lot of pain for the survivors and for the families because there was a lot of uh, broken families. 
broken marriages, alcoholism, depression, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so those, uh, those crew members suffered a lot, but so did the families. The hardest part was the, the reaction of our own government toward us. And we were actually, the fingers were pointed at us. And uh, the Israelis were, they, weren't, they, they were never questioned as to why they did it. They only questioned us. The families still want answers from their government, which remains silent. For many, some memories never fade. We had a wonderful time just being together. I met Alan um, at a party. We spent a lot of time talking throughout the evening. And at the end of the evening, he said to me, um, are you busy tomorrow afternoon? And I said, well, no. And he said, do you think we could get married? Then I was told that he was among the dead. It was absolutely the worst moment of my life. There's not a day that doesn't go by where I don't think about those guys. I mean, I went through hell, but they left the earth. When I'm walking up to the mass grave, I still feel a connection with those people. Hard to explain, but it's still there, so I want to remember that connection as long as I can. What we shared, what we felt. It took 13 years of haggling before both sides finally agreed a compensation deal for the ship. By 1980, the bill plus interest was just over $17 million. Israel offered six. The Americans accepted, then sold the Liberty for $100,000 scrap. The settlement for the victims was quicker, but many are still unhappy with it today. Not feel it was a fair settlement. I would have fought it. But I was so uh, sad and broken. Uh, I just didn't have the energy to take on that fight. And it wasn't a fight that I thought I could win. The State Department um, were very eager for the uh, survivors to make that settlement. They sent a check for the, the amount, and that, that was that. The American government came up with a formula for the Israelis to compensate the widows and children for their loss. This included a payment for shock and mental anguish. The widows got $25,000, with $10,000 for each of their children over five. An American government lawyer doubted that children under five could sufficiently comprehend the event to suffer shock and grief. The US proposed they should therefore receive nothing, an offer the Israelis accepted. Since the attack on the Liberty, the USA and Israel have grown ever closer. At the time, George Ball, the US Under Secretary of State, noted that it seemed clear to the Israelis that as American leaders did not have the courage to punish them for the blatant murder of American citizens, they would let them get away with anything. <laughs> 